right, the Reds, it's another Talking Reds. And on this Talking Reds, we are joined by Jonathan Northcroft, who is the football correspondent at the Sunday Times and has been since 2009. Uh, we've had them on the Anfield Wrap before, uh, back in the dark days when it looked like our studio, we were conducting some kind of seance or something. Uh, but, you know, we've we've moved on since then. Uh, we'd love to have Jonathan back in the new studio, it's fair to say. Uh, but we've got him over Skype, next best, next best thing. Um, and yeah, we're going to have a bit of a chat about a few things that have come up here. First off, I think we've got to mention, of course, uh, I'm sure most people have seen this, that Michael Robinson sadly passed away uh, overnight. The, the news has come out this morning. Um, obviously, both from Brighton and Hove Albion, uh, signed for £200,000 in 1983. And while he was at Liverpool, Liverpool won the league in 83-84, the League Cup in 1984, and of course, the European Cup in 1984. So not a bad time for Michael to have been around. Uh, 52 appearances for Liverpool, 13 goals, really well liked, not only at Liverpool, but seemingly at all his clubs and, and by all his media colleagues, because he went on, Jonathan, of course, to have a career in, in Spanish tele- television and, and was excellent at that by all accounts. Yeah, I mean, re- reading the tributes, it, what strikes you is a number of top Spanish footballers that, that say that Michael Robinson was part of their childhoods, that the shows he did on, on Spanish TV were incredible in terms of tactical insight but he had this natural sort of charm a great broadcasting style um and it's you know somebody that was a staple i think of spanish life before you even sort of get to to his impact here i i didn't i didn't really know him particularly well i'll be honest um but i do know um colleagues who spoke so highly of him he just seemed to be that guy that everyone liked very very popular but also very respected for how good he was because I think in the, I think in the last maybe maybe the last ten years we've seen more ex players make that really convincing transition to broadcasting, mm. but before then you know there was there was something maybe a bit wooden or a bit kind of buttoned up about players that went into the media. They still wanted to kind of keep things close to their chest, and and he broke the mold. You know he was he was a natural broadcaster. He was he was somebody that was as good at that as he was on the pitch, and and really sort of pioneered that. Um, and you know, obviously, when people pass, there's there's, there's generally a positive outpouring, mm. but you can see there's a depth to it with Michael Robinson, uh, a, a sort of strength to it. Um, and let's not forget, as you, as you mentioned, Rob, he, he he played at a, a hell of a time for for Liverpool to even get in yeah. that side in '83, four, make 50 appearances, score those goals, um, shows he was a pretty decent player as well. Yeah, absolutely. Some really nice tributes, as you say, Jonathan, out there today. Uh, Graham Souness is his excellent on Sky, really poignant, obviously a very close friend of his. Uh, we've also shared a piece today on the Anfield Wrap, uh, which was Simon Hughes, uh, when he was writing The Red Machine, uh, sat down, well, had a day with Michael, really, and it sounds an excellent day. Uh, food, drink and, and a lovely chat about politics, about football, about Michael's life. And Simon documented that really, really well. And we were fortunate enough on the wrap to share the whole chapter of that on the website. We've reshared that out there today. Uh, so take a look at our socials and you can have a read of that and get a sense of Michael if you don't remember who he is. Because obviously I, I appreciate there's lots of people of different ages watching the shows. Uh, just moving on to um, another thing, another little bit of history today then, Jonathan. Obviously, uh, 30 years ago today, league title number 18 for Liverpool. Lots of former players and former managers on the television uh, and in the papers today just sort of saying, we've no idea how it's gone this long <laughs> without without Liverpool winning another one. Uh, you know, you obviously covered the patch uh, yeah. for quite a long time, Jonathan, got some good context ar- around this area and stuff like that. I mean, what what was your sense of it, the way it, it's affected Liverpool all these years? Because we've heard Brendan Rodgers, we've, we've heard Jürgen Klopp as well talk about it as a burden. I think Jürgen's called it a backpack. Brendan's called it a heavy shirt. Yeah. Uh, there is that sense that the, the pressure's got to a few players and a few sides and a few managers over the years. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I, I, I suppose I reflect on is uh, I, I started covering Liverpool in earnest around about 2001. You know, my, my first job at the Sunday Times was the North of England correspondent, which was essentially United and Liverpool with Everton and City, who weren't so big at the time, um, thrown in. And that was the Hulier era. And, you know, 2001, 2002, Hulier was really in his prime, I would say. Uh, him and Phil Thompson had a really good thing going there. But 
even at that point, so you're only talking, what, 10, 11 years since the, the last title, I remember being hit straight away by the desperation, the, the, the desire, and the feeling that it was a big thing even then. You know, and, and Hule was a, a guy that, you know, had spent time in Liverpool, as we know. He was a Liverpool fan. He, he knew the culture. Yeah. He knew... He, he, he felt it. You could see he felt it. Phil Thompson certainly felt it. That, of course, was the year that, that, that Liverpool went quite close in the Champions League. They ran into a... They're good in the league, you know, and they won the, they won the, 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 the treble or whatever you, some people called it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, but, they, but Arsenal were just unbelievable. You know, yeah. Arsenal had Henry and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And there was a sense that it might come. There was a sense that it might come and... and um, I remember the signings of Salif Jao and El Hajj Jouf in two, mm. 2002. That was supposed to be the thing that was going to push Liverpool over the line. As we know, that wasn't the best thing that Hooli ever ever did. But as I said, there was a feeling that it was only a matter of time back then. And then, of course, Rafa came 2004 with all that he did, the, the 2009 season when Liverpool just seemed on the brink. I think in, the, I think in that initial period, it was a case of running into really good teams. You know, yeah. the United team in 2008-9, that Arsenal team, the Mourinho side. Um, I don't think you could say it was psychological, but I do think that um, there was probably a period after Rafa's departure where, you know, the kind of angst, anxiety probably did affect some of the decision-making at the at the club. Um, but I, th- I do think that it's a thing that one of the best things Jürgen has done is 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 find a way in his inimitable way to to kind of turn it turn it all around and yeah. almost make it. I wouldn't say he's made it into a positive, but he's made he's confronted it and it's not it's just not been a thing. I don't think I don't think it was a factor last year in in, in not quite overhauling City and the mental strength of this this Liverpool is there to be seen. So somehow he's he's managed to take the backpack off, you know, which is which is an incredible psychological feat. I think that the other dynamic to it as well um, is obviously the success of Manchester United and Ferguson yeah. referencing Liverpool all the time. Obviously, yeah. the famous quote about the perch and all the rest of it. I, I think that that added to the hair, didn't it? Yeah. And that added to the pressure from the fans on managers and players. Yeah, I think it did because uh, he made it. I suppose he made it personal in a way. Mm. He made it about Liverpool. That I mean, I'm an Aberdeen fan. That's how, that's how he operated. So when he was Aberdeen manager. He made it all about the old firm. He loved to have a demon and a target to overhaul, and it was all about Glasgow's dominance. We're going to crash it, you know. And, and which was ironic; he'd been a Rangers player. But so he did that with United. He he almost he almost put Liverpool there as something to to fuel his own team and to to shoot at. And I've spoken to United players in that era, and even though Arsenal and there was that Wenger v Fergie and Keane v Vieira rivalry. But it was still Liverpool. They, they'll tell you that it was still Liverpool was the one for Ferguson and, and and for that team. So that I think that was part of what he did. And of course, it is it was unbelievable the way that you know they were they were able to do the unthinkable, which was to to overhaul the, the eighteen titles. And that was part of it as well. Um, so yeah, it's all, all all part all part of the story. But as I say, it, it's something that does feel like it's finally come full circle again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in, in the 30 years, there have obviously been five runners-up spots for Liverpool. Plenty of them, though, have been boom, then bust, and, and managerial changes and things like that. But as you say, last season, although we finished as runners-up, mm. it almost felt... it, it didn't. We, I, I personally didn't feel down about it. I thought we're still on the crest of a wave. We obviously win the European Cup. Mm. And then when we come into this season, you just thought... The, I hate to use the phrase for obvious reasons, but... I did think we could go again, <laughs> um, <laughs> as, yeah. as someone once said. But, but as you say, Robert, it's been boom and bust. And if this season Liverpool had just dropped off again, that would have been following the pattern of the past. Yeah. You know, 2008-9, that Rafa team looked incredible. It actually seemed like it was a matter of time. But a year later, he'd gone. You know, the thing was a shambles. You know, think what happened with Brent with Brendan. So that's what I mean about Jurgen making things different. The the, the 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 cycle of the past would have been for this season to be a disaster, and it's the exact opposite. And obviously, the the big question for everyone now is: Will Liverpool get the opportunity to get the job done? Yeah. You know, only two more wins required. 
to confirm a 19th title for Liverpool. But the conversation keeps on changing. I know you wrote a piece on Sunday for the Sunday Times. There's another piece in the Times today talking about some concern among Premier League clubs about playing football at neutral venues. Mm. On that point in particular, I I mean, of course I am biased. I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm a Liverpool season ticket holder. I'm from the Anfield Rap. But nevertheless, I don't get the idea that there's a problem there because... There's not gonna. It's not gonna be in front of a crowd, and surely that's when you get a home advantage. When you've got the cop, mm-hmm. when you've got the Stratford End, when you've got the Gladys Street, when you've got an empty stadium, it's pretty much approaching what you're doing in a training session. So I don't yeah. get the. I don't really get the concern around that one, do you? No, I don't actually. I, I mean, I, I went to Liber- I went to England v Croatia in 2018. Closed doors game played in Rijeka which is a 6,000-seater stadium. You know, the Croats knew there was no no crowd. So they actually just chose this sort of tiny little place because yeah. from their point of view, it didn't matter if they played it in Zagreb or, or, or wherever. And I kind of think that's the case. You know, I I, I think the, the, the important thing is getting games played. So this, oh, it'd, be a, it'd be a minimal, minimal advantage, I think, without fans to be playing at home. Like the only advantage I can think of is that you spare yourself the travel. But... Um, you know, there's many things that can be done. A player said to me uh, a few weeks ago, "Why not just play at training grounds? You could you could easily do that. Yeah, wouldn't you? Wouldn't have the big sort of security aspects, a big sort of build up. Um, I just uh, may, maybe the other factor is what the product will look like. Maybe this is a TV company thing where they want it to be played yeah. in stadiums. But the idea is maybe pick two or three stadiums that can be secure venues and and play the games. There and and I think that would be fine. I think it'd be the same for everyone. It's not going to be perfect. That's the point. Yeah. When, when football comes back, it just isn't going to be what it's been until now. It's not going to be perfect. So compromises are going to going to have to be made. And that's the thing, isn't it? And you you, you do get the sense that the, the direction of travel is to towards mm-hmm. it getting it getting done, it getting resumed, and all the rest of it. And obviously, Wafer have put some kind of deadline out there today. They want to know by May the 25th, I yeah. think it is. And then the Premier League are saying the aim and for June the 8th, I think it is. Obviously, Bundesliga a month before. And yet, despite all that, there remains these dissenting voices. We obviously, it, it started what seems a long time ago now, but wasn't that long ago, Karen Brady. Yeah. Then, we've had, then we've had, you know, Wofford's, Wofford coming out today saying little bits and bobs and mm. and there are rumours that there are sort of four or five clubs maybe that that would prefer it not to be continued but do you mm. see that happening in any way? Um, the, one, the, the one thing I haven't heard is any real support for voiding the season mm. which I think is a, you know that, that, that's, that, that's the first thing um, other than that it's, there's a lot of self-interest going on so yeah. yeah I think there are a few clubs that would like to, to can it um, in some way, I also heard there's a few clubs in the middle of the Premier League who got nothing to play for, but they actually want to get back. And the reason they want to get back is prize money because yeah. you can you can earn eight or nine million quid. Then you got the teams at the top, obviously, who for different reasons some want to play, some don't. Um, you know, Sheffield United would want to play. Obviously, they could they could somehow get in the Champions League. Um, I what I can see happening now is there's a, a lot of planning. Uh, there's a lot of government and, and, and the Premier League itself are, are trying to find ways to, to, to make it continue. UEFA are trying to push that. The, the, the bit that I'm sceptical about is what happens on the pitch. So when I speak to players and managers, I am hearing a slightly different story. And that's them just saying, how, how is this going to work? And that's, that's a doubt I've got. Um, the, the, the FIFA chief medical officer has just come out this morning and said he can't quite understand how actually playing is going to work with social distancing. Yeah. Um, I just think there's massive questions. Um, yeah. uh, you know, the, 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 the project restart, they're talking about June the 8th, players will only need three weeks training. Everyone I've spoken to says four weeks. Do you know what I mean? So mm. I, I, I think we do, it's obvious that we're waiting to see what happens in Germany, um, that that's going to kind of define, I think, and lead the way. But the, the one thing I haven't heard any kind of real support for us just scrapping the season. Um, I think it's. I think there'll be an attempt to play. As I say, there's doubts I've got about how it'll actually work on the pitch. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I think curtailing it in some way will be the the, the event. But that, 
I don't know how that would feel winning the title for Liverpool in a you know in a kind of press release from the Premier League saying right you've won the title. I mean, yeah. Which maybe it doesn't matter, does it? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think it does have an asterisk by it, which is what everyone's saying. But you know, if you look at the as much as I hate to use the phrase, the banter on social media, that's what everyone's saying. Well, you wouldn't have really won it. And it's a bit like, well, we are 25 from clear, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think I, th- I think it's obvious why Liverpool fans are saying that they want to see it done. I mean, the other thing to mention, obviously, is that we're talking in very, you know, we're talking straight in football terms yeah. here. But, you know, this is always going to be led by public health experts, by the government itself. And for me, there's still a concern there around the actual testing because, yeah, you know, you yeah. read about the testing, obviously it, it's still not rolled out properly in this country as it should be, which is an issue in itself. But also there's there's evidence there that you can be tested, show, show up as negative and yet be, you know, able to transmit coronavirus. So so that, that that's a huge problem for talking about bringing sport back, isn't it? I think it is. And, and, and I think you're absolutely right that... The, it's got to be in that context. So, you know, if, if, if you're not confident with the testing or, or in fact, the testing also seems to be taking quite a bit of time to get results back. Now, you know, I think players or, or anyone arriving at that stadium would need to have a test that then the results show up almost straight away. And then leaving the ground, they need to have the same test on the way out because they've got to go home to their families. Yeah. Um, I don't see how you can have football spending four or five million pounds on tests at a time when nurses can't get tested. I, I, I just think that's where the game's got to know its place. Yeah. Um, and I also don't see how you can have, and this is the FIFA medical officer's point, how you can have social distancing regulations and then just scrap them for people playing football on a pitch. It's just how that looks. It's a message that creates yeah, yeah. as much as anything else. So, I think it it it's, it can only be possible to play again if we shift a little bit in the next few weeks from where we are right now. Because right now it just feels like a, so many things would be wrong with playing a game of football. But you know we don't know what way this is going to go in the next three or four weeks. That that it's got to it's got to catch up before football can be played. Yeah. Well, what's your sense on the other side of of what appears to be quite a big problem, which is you know the the contracts and players mm-hmm. who were due to leave, players who probably, if we're all honest, agreed to maybe have got going to be going somewhere else, and then yeah. they're expected to refocus their mind and play for what the, in their mind was their old club again. Now, I know. Um, what 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 what's, what's your sense of the dynamic with that? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think the the individual players concerned are in a real odd position. You know, you've also got to throw loan signings into it, who they don't even know what's happening. They don't know what's happening past June the thirtieth. Um, you've also, when football does come back, it's going to be like nine games in thirty days. So it's going to test players' commitment, test them physically. I guess what I'm saying is, no, somebody that's not hundred percent committed to the cause, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't be sure about using them. I'd probably want to have an honest conversation with them. Um, I think it's really difficult to ask a player who's out of contract on June the 30th, come on, can you just give us eight games in 20 days and then then you can be off? I mean, you know, it's it. we'd all love to think they're going to play the place for the shirt, but they got they have got to play for themselves as well a yeah. little bit. I think it's, it's, it's more of a problem in the championship, though. At least, I think the Premier League's 60 players, I think, are out of contract or something. But if you go down the leagues, it's just the numbers are enormous. Yeah. Um, what one thing I wanted to point people towards, Jonathan. I really enjoy reading um, your your Facebook page that you've got, Jonathan Northcraft, mm. journalist. Um, I wanted to point people towards that because I think what he's doing on there is, is is a little bit different in that you know we see journalists for various organisations and we read what they do or we watch what they do or we see them on Sunday supplements or whatever. I think you being prepared on that page to sometimes talk about what I I would call the the, the darker side of the game and even. <laughs> Or, yeah. or even the more difficult yeah. aspects of the profession as well. You know, I've enjoyed reading that because you know I've I've only yeah. ever worked as a as a sub editor, but even working as a sub editor, that's that's not particularly glamorous at times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think it's it's good a for you know the realities of anyone looking to break into journalism. And I know people have got time on their hands at the moment, so maybe give it a read for that reason. But you posted a piece on there which I think was also in the paper about how maybe football could use this situation. Yeah 
as a as a catalyst for change and moving away from some of the grimmer and grimier sides to the game. I just wanted you to talk maybe about you know one or two of the things that you know. Let, let let's think about a perfect world when we do resume and um, when football does come back. What what things would you like football to move away from a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, th- thanks, Robin. I I I think the biggest thing, and it was a feeling I've had from the start, is that for whatever reason. Over the over the my time in, in in reporting on the game, it's just become overinflated. Um, the media plays a big part in that. The, the way we built football up, the way we talk of over dramatized stuff, is a big part of that. Obviously, big business is a, is is a part of that. But I just think this is a a chance to have a reality check for the game, and to start thinking about having just existing within the world we're in. So that that's yeah. a number of things. You know, just to pick at random, the fact that I think f- only five Premier League clubs pay the pay the living wage is absolutely absolutely scandalous, mm. given the the amount of money that's that, that's washing through the game. You know, little things like um, I, I know we've got environmental stuff. You know, taking an air, taking a plane from Arsenal did it from Luton to Norwich to play to play a match. You know, a fourteen minute flight or whatever. There's no need for football to do all this sort yeah. of stuff. Um, it's got to start thinking of the fans. It's got to start thinking of people, not just the bottom line all the time. All these ridiculous kickoff times that, that always seem to be chosen to coincide with, with the trains not running from London back up to the north and, and, and asking fans to do all that sort of stuff. Um, just, you know, I, I, it's not players' wages per se. Everyone always alights on players' wages as the yeah. kind of thing that's wrong with the game. You know, I don't blame players for what they are, and it's part of the game's economics. I wish, that, you know, I wish the economics were different. But I just, I, I, I just think that football's just got to go back to to being, you know, for the people, for 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 joy, for 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 um, the reasons we fall in love with that. I know this all sounds a bit kind of wishy washy, but I just, I just felt it's 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 gone far too far away from that. It's been used for political reasons. Um, it, it gets used by you know venture capitalists to to make a quick buck and and, and leave again. Um, this is a chance to be different when it comes back, and from a media point of view, to take to take responsibility and not write about the game as if it's life and death, and not to build you know scandals up into something or things up into scandals when they're not. And and um, you know I you know I used a quote from Klopp in that where he said it's the it's the most important of the least important things yeah. in life, and actually that sums it up better than better than I could. I'd, I'd, I'd like that to be how the game is regarded and how it, how it projects itself, and cut away the other stuff. And I could I could talk about agents and their fees, and there's there's there's, there's a whole shopping list of stuff that's wrong. But I guess that's the biggest thing. Just get back to 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 just having a reality check, knowing knowing, knowing what it's there for, which yeah. is a wonderful thing. You know, but the, the thing I've missed most in lockdown, I'll be honest, is actually playing football. It's playing five aside on a Friday night. Yeah, I miss that more than the glitz and glamour of the Premier League, and that tells me a story. Yeah, I, I just, I just, funny enough, was chatting with a journalist from CNN, ask, and he was asking about, you know, how I felt about as a Liverpool fan about mm. football coming back, but not coming back in the same way, it being behind closed doors. And he, and he was talking about the title. He was talking about, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he was like, you know, what, what is it for you that you know, you've really missed. I'm, I'm, as much as I love this team and I love Firmino and I love Trent and all the rest of it and they played some fantastic football, you know, similar to you, the, the bit that I'm really missing is just going the game with me mates, yeah. having, a, having, a, having a pint afterwards, you know, yeah. dissecting it with your mates and that kind of yeah. thing. And, you know, the football is, is brilliant and we love it and we love the skills that we see and all the rest of it. But it, it, it's that bit that I'm really missing, that social aspect, that, yeah. that bit, shared joy with friends and that kind of stuff. That's what it's there. It's to connect people, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, to connect absolutely. people. Uh, it's to bring joy in, a, in, in you know, in, in, in our world. It's, it, it's to serve the communities that they're in. Um, and I'd, I'd love that to be a kind of some sort of fit and proper test for clubs that's based on what they do for their fans and what they do for their communities. I'm not entirely sure how the detail of that would work, but it seems to me that that's as important as anything. You know, yeah. that's as important as financial fair play and all that other regs. Some kind of way of testing 
um, how how they actually behave towards the the public and the area that's around their ground and the training ground and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a, that seems a good way uh, to sum up. Uh, very very well said as usual. And as I say, if you want to follow Jonathan's Facebook page, it is Jonathan Northcroft. Journalists give that search in the little search bar on Facebook. It'll pop up. Give him a follow. And like I say, he shares some interesting stuff on there away from the usual journalism world. Uh, thanks very much for thanks, coming mate. on this morning, Jonathan. Really enjoyed Lovely. the chat. Hopefully thanks. get you on again soon, mate. And uh, take yeah. it easy and stay sane. Stay safe. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, same to you, Robo. Thanks a lot for that. Cheers, mate. Thank you. That's been talking about.